I used to suck at achieving my goals. I could make goals, but like most of us, they never ended up working out. It took reading books like Heidi Grant Halverson's Nine Things Successful People Do Differently to learn what I was doing wrong. The very first chapter pointed out that my goals were too vague and that successful people choose specific goals. This chapter also shows the value of being detailed about the steps within goals and going back and forth over them. Being specific in this way does a few major things. It makes us think concretely about what we want and the specific hurdles we have to overcome to get there. It also allows these goals and steps to be tracked and measured easily. That's the first of nine proven strategies. Get specific. Another problem I used to have was getting to the end of the day not having done much on my to-do list. This is especially discouraging when I know I had the time to spare. The second strategy taught me that having a good to-do list is not enough. You have to decide when and where you are going to take action. Using if-then planning is an incredibly effective method to help with this because it uses the language of the brain, the language of contingencies. This method of planning allows you to easily execute plans without wasting time deliberating between options or draining willpower. The second strategy is seize the moment to act on your goals. Ever got caught thinking you have tons of time left on a project only to realize you've left it too late? If you aren't aware of how far along you are or how well you are doing, you can't adjust your behavior accordingly. This is where feedback comes in and it's very difficult to stay motivated without it. Two common ways of assessing feedback on progress are to-go thinking and to-date thinking. To-date thinking can be helpful at the beginning of something as the path ahead can look daunting, but later it can be deceiving and give you a premature sense of progress that tricks you into slowing down, reducing effort, and even overburdening yourself by taking on other important goals. The third strategy is know exactly how far you have left to go. When I was in the fourth grade, I was in a public speaking competition. I didn't see the need to prepare because my parents and friends kept telling me I'd do great. And when my turn came to speak, I shook and I froze and I bombed. There were only three people competing. One of us got gold, one got silver, and they put the bronze away and gave me a thank you for coming ribbon. And I think that was the right call. I stunk. Strategy number four says, Visualizing effortless success is disastrous, and it's good advice only if you're trying to sabotage the recipient. You can still be an optimist, but you can be an optimist who is well prepared for potential obstacles, because there are two kinds of optimists. Unrealistic optimists are more than happy to tell you that you're being negative when you bring up those potential obstacles, while realistic optimists understand the vital difference between believing you will succeed and believing you will succeed easily because thinking things will come to you effortlessly leaves you ill-prepared for the journey ahead. The fourth strategy is be a realistic optimist. Later in life, a job required me to speak to rooms full of teachers and technology experts. I prepared by watching YouTube videos on how to be good at public speaking, and with those tools in hand, my legs still shook, my voice still froze up, and I still bombed. And when you're a grown up, no one gives you a ribbon. When my goal was simply to be good at something, the very real prospect of failing to meet expectations was terrifying and filled me with anxiety. Using tips from the fifth strategy, I allowed myself to screw up and decided only to compare my current performance to my own past performances, and only then did I start seeing improvement. Don't get me wrong, I still kind of stink, but without this strategy, I absolutely wouldn't have made the progress I have. The fifth strategy is, Focus on getting better rather than being good. Did you know that Alan Rickman decided to quit his job and start acting at the age of 42 and soon after landed the role of Hans Gruber in Die Hard? This story is often told as an example of how it's never too late to follow your dreams. It's too bad it isn't true. He actually started studying acting in 1972, more than 15 years before Die Hard. Working on something for 15 years takes grit. Entity theorists have a hard time understanding grit. They believe that our abilities are fixed and blame uncontrollable factors for failure, while incremental theorists believe that abilities can be acquired, improvement is possible, and blame controllable factors for failure. Grit is persistence, commitment to long-term goals, and remembering to challenge entity thinking whenever you feel yourself succumbing to it. Remember J.K. Rowling, who was rejected 12 times before finding a publisher for Harry Potter. Successful people remember not to give up in the face of difficulty even when they're tired, discouraged, or just plain bored. Strategy number six is 
have grit. Ever wonder why you wanna eat a whole box of cookies after having an awful day? It has to do with willpower, and understanding willpower is the key to self-control. First of all, your daily willpower has a capacity, and certain things, like a day of difficult decision-making, can drain willpower. Luckily, certain things, like having a power nap or listening to a great song, can replenish willpower. What might be less known is that you can actually up your capacity, because like a muscle, it can be strengthened with routine. One way of doing this is to start like any other workout, beginning with a simple exercise doing small things you'd kinda rather not do, like making your bed every day or brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand. It will be hard in the beginning, but it will get easier, and eventually you can take on tougher challenges. Strategy number seven is build your willpower muscle. Ever promise yourself you'll have just a few chips or watch one YouTube video only to find an empty bag beside you three hours later? Even for people with extreme willpower capacity, the daily supply is still limited. Studies show that people are likely to fail at all their goals when they take on too many at the same time. So keep an eye out for when your willpower muscle is weak and change things up so you don't need to rely on willpower at all. Stop before you start. I use this strategy when I'm on sites that are designed to be addictive. I set a start time for my next task using an app or alarm. A friend of mine puts a reasonable amount of chips in a bowl and puts the bag away, never having to use willpower to stop herself from having more. Goals are hard enough already. Successful people know not to make succeeding in a goal any harder than it needs to be. Strategy number eight is don't tempt fate. Don't think about velociraptors. Now, what are you thinking about? Don't and won't plans are called suppression plans, and they don't work. Ignore plans are proven to be even less effective than suppression plans. And for both of these types of plans, the impulse doesn't get suppressed. It actually gets strengthened, causing failures and even binges. If you want to successfully change your ways, ask yourself, what will I do instead? Work it into an if-then plan from strategy two, and now you have a replacement behavior plan. These replace a negative behavior with a positive one, and are far more effective. The critical part of your if-then plan is what you will do, not what you won't do. And like strategy number one states, the more specific, the better. Strategy number nine is focus on what you will do, not on what you won't do. And those are nine things successful people do differently. Thanks for watching.